the Bible is a revelation of eternal truth. This eternal truth is called in scripture Jesus Christ. It is written without regard for secular history. It's all about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ defines himself as the truth. He says, I am the truth. And that is our subject tonight. It's all about Jesus Christ. But I'm speaking of the power of God. For Jesus Christ is described in scripture as the creative power of God. And the wisdom of God. We are told that Jesus Christ is in you. Do you not realize that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. So I'm speaking of a creative power buried in man. The only creative power in the world. So completely forget secular history when you read scripture. It's all about a power that is in you. Now he defines himself as the truth. That I am the truth. But God's truth is not so much contrasted with falsehood as it is with fickleness. Choose this day whom you will serve. Then we are told, he replied, I choose to serve the Lord. Then he asked the crowd, and they said, we will serve the Lord. Then he said, you are witnesses to yourself. And so we are witnesses to ourselves, whether we are truly serving the Lord, which is the truth. Now, who is he and what is he? I tell you, he is your own wonderful human imagination. That is Christ Jesus of Scripture. That is God. That is the Lord. Now, I would try to explain it, and you may say, well, I will believe it, and I, to the best of my ability, I will be faithful to it. And then, suddenly, you turn away. You come home and you say, I met so-and-so today, and you know what he said to me? As long as my business opens and continues, you have a job. You have turned completely from your confidence and your faith in God, which is your own imagination, to a man. And all men are liars. As we are told, they're all liars. Two months later, you are fired. You came home and you're so proud that he's going to keep you forever. Who wants to be kept forever on any one job? Is there no growth, no expansion in it? And so it is the contrast of truth in Scripture is not with falsehood. It is with fickleness. Man turns from the one true God to another that is no God. So I ask you tonight to believe me. The Christ of Scripture is your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. And there is nothing impossible to God if you know the true God. If you think he's on the outside, well, then you do not know the true God. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. I hope you'll realize we have not failed in the test. Now, everything, but everything is possible to him. Well, how do I do it, and how do I go about testing it and proving it? If I really believe it, that my imagination is God, and there is no other God, that everything in my world, no matter what it is today, it was first imagined, the suit I wear, the building that now houses me, the chairs, everything in the world, 
had to be first imagined and then executed, but it first had to be imagined. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And I said, well, I'll believe him. I will put all my faith in him. Now, to what extent will I be faithful? For truth in scripture is the steadfast faithfulness of God. As we are told, I will make a covenant with you. My steadfast faithfulness and sure love to David. That is my covenant with you. I have made him a witness to the people. Tonight I will tell you what it means. I will tell you exactly what that covenant is with us. He is a witness to this truth of God. He called him his son. He will not violate it. He tells me now he dwells in me as my very being. He dwells in me and he's going to prove to me that his covenant will not be violated. His covenant is I have made a covenant with you. My steadfast, sure love for David. I made him a witness to the people. What witness? that he is my son, and I dwell in you. I have found him in me as my imagination, and I can't get away from my imagination. I can't put it over there and remain here. There's no place where I can go and put it elsewhere. If I dream, I am the dreamer. That's imagination. If I wake, no matter what I'm doing, I'm imagining. And I cannot separate myself from this core of my own being, which is my imagination. He became the very core of my being. And now he has made a pledge to me that I will actually prove one day that his pledge to me, his covenant with me, is kept. His sure and steadfast love for David, I will know. And he tells me David is his son. Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And if he dwells in me as my own imagination, one day, if he keeps his place, I must know I am the father of David. For he is the father of David. Now, can I be faithful to that being who said to me that he is faithful to his covenant with me? Or will I tomorrow, or tonight, or next year, be fickle and turn from the only God to something that is not God. Now, I'll tell you a story. Take a scene, any scene in the world, which would imply that you are the one that you want to be. I don't care what you want to be. Take a scene. When you look at it, if it implies that you are the man, the woman that you want to be, who is looking at it? God is looking at it. God is your own wonderful human imagination. And all things are possible to God. Will you now remain faithful to what you are seeing and keep that vision in time of trouble? Or will you be diverted and then turn to something that is not God? If you remain faithful to God, knowing that God is your own wonderful human imagination, no power on earth can stop it from coming to pass, because there is no other power. If you turn to false gods, turn to a man who makes you all kinds of promises, you're turning to a false god. If you remain faithful to this and this only God, you cannot fail in this world. That is what scripture teaches. It's a complete revelation of an eternal truth. If you remain faithful to this and this only God, you cannot fail in this world. 
That is what Scripture teaches. It's a complete revelation of an eternal truth written without regard or secular history. When you read these characters in Scripture, forget characters. They aren't characters. As you and I are persons, they aren't persons. They are eternal states through which you and I pass. We pass through these states. Coming into a climax, and the climax is called Jesus Christ, which also is a state. When you reach that state, you have found God. And everything said of him in scripture will be said of you. Everything is said of him that he experienced, you will experience. David in scripture called him my God. David in the spirit will call you my God, which means my father. For God is father. He will call you my Lord. He will call you my father. And you will know that he is your father. And the covenant is kept. We have to keep it on our side here as it is kept by the eternal being. So truth in scripture does not mean what we think it means here. For instance, a true judgment on this world of Caesar means that if I say that a flower is here and there is no flower to support my claim, well then it's a false judgment. A true judgment must conform to the facts and if the facts will not support my judgment, then we call it a false judgment. That's not what scripture speaks about. It allows me to say that a flower is here. It allows me to say that I am seeing what my mortal eye cannot see. It allows me to see that I am actually seeing what is not there to be seen, that my mortal eye cannot see. And if I dare to persist in my assumption that it is there, and I'm seeing it, and sleep in it as though it were true, it will become an objective fact. That's what scripture teaches. That when you pray, believe that you have received and you will. Whatever you desire, believe you have it and you will. I must not wait for facts to believe that I am the man that I want to be. I produce the facts if I know who I am. And I am all imagination. So I'm an imagining being and I'm imagining that I am what I would like to be. I persist in my imagination, believing it to be true now. If I persist in my assumption, it will become a fact. That's what scripture teaches. Do I really believe in that God? Or am I fickle? And am I turning from that God, the only God, to something that is not a God? That is the question asked in scripture. So in the book of Joshua, choose this day whom you will serve. And Joshua replied, we choose the Lord. And the Lord really means I am. It's the only God in the world. That is my name forever. Forever and forever. So I will choose to serve the Lord. And the Lord is I am. Then he turns to the people. You make your choice. And there's a, we choose the Lord. He said, you are witnesses to your choice. We are witnesses, said the people. But they soon forgot and turned to some false God. Now you can, morning, noon, and night, check yourself as to whether you're really believing in the only true God or putting your faith in a false God. So I'm not saying that men should not be trusted. But don't put your hope in any man in this world. Oh, they'll tell you all kinds of things. I have friends of mine who will say to me, I just came back, you know what the boss said to me? The job is yours forever. I'm speaking now from experience. Two months later, he was fired. He didn't do one thing that was wrong. There was a change in policy, and his department was simply closed. And he had put all confidence and all faith in that man. Another one, something similar. Forty odd years ago, when I was fired from 
J.C. Penney running up and down the elevator, putting hats in bins, doing all kinds of silly, stupid things. And they gave me the large sum of money of $22 a week. Of course, that was years ago. And I asked the man, why did you fire me? What have I done? He said, you haven't done anything that's wrong, but there's a little change in the economy at the moment, and so we have to let out people, and you have to be let out. You've been here a year, and so you've been very good, but... We have to simply economize now, and that job, at the moment, we have to dispense with it. I said, where I came from, we don't do that. A man doesn't steal, and he doesn't violate the code of decency. They go through these ups and downs and keep him. So we don't do that here, he said. He simply has to cut quickly, cut fake quickly. He thought, well, now this man is a greenhorn. I was only 18 years old, so I took this little letter over to my friend at Macy's. And they gave me a little letter at Macy's. And so they reduced me from 22 to $18 a week, doing the same stupid things, this time in the grocery department, filling bins with all kinds of cans. So I worked there about a 10 months. I figured no one's going to fire me ever again. I'm going to quit. And so I quit. I went to the boss. I said, I'm quitting as of now. So what's wrong? Said, Nothing. Not a thing is wrong, but I'm quitting. I'm going to work for myself from now on. Not working for anyone. Well, I did work for others, but I never considered it working for others. I was on my own. Started dancing. I couldn't dance. Never took a dancing lesson in my life, but I said, I can dance. Started to dance. You can do any of this work that you want. Didn't take any lessons, so they picked, picked me up and said, all right, he's arrogant enough to do it. Let him do it. And so I did it. And danced for 11 years, six Broadway shows, all through the country in vaudeville, nightclubs, by sheer arrogance, by feeling I can do it. I'm telling you, you can do anything in this world that you want to do but you've got to find Christ. He is the only creator in the world. And when people talk about Christ on the outside, forget it. There is no Christ on the outside. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And Christ in you is your own wonderful human imagination. That is Christ. And there is no other Christ. He is buried within you. One day he will rise within you, not as another, he will rise within you, and you are Christ. No loss of identity and no change of identity. Same being, only all the things said of him begins to happen in you. It is said of him that David called him my father. He called you my father. And you know he is your son, and you know you are his father. As the Son of Man was lifted up like a serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up in you. And you are lifted up in the same manner. May I tell you? Did you say that the whole temple was split from top to bottom? And then he said, that temple was my body. Well, your body is split from top to bottom. And you are saying, just like a fiery serpent, the same thing. You find yourself in a grave, and you come out of the grave, it happens to you. There were witnesses to your birth, it happens to you. A dove descended upon him, and that was called the Holy Spirit, and it remained on him, it happens to you. The whole thing actually happens in you, on you, and then you know who you are. I am telling you that you are suffering tonight. The whole vast world is suffering from amnesia. Total amnesia. Because they think that they are John Brown. They're... And you come out of the grave, it happens to you. You are witnesses to your birth, it happens to you. A dove descended upon him, and that was called the Holy Spirit, and it remained on him, it happens to you. 
The whole thing actually happens in you, on you. And then you know who you are. I am telling you that you are suffering tonight. The whole vast world is suffering from amnesia. Total amnesia. Because they think that they are John Brown. They think that they're never got it. They think that they're Mary Smith. And they are Jesus Christ. Now if you are Jesus Christ and you don't know it, and he does all things in the world, then remain John Brown. And worship some Jesus Christ that does not exist. If a man tonight is suffering from total amnesia, and as John Smith, he has a fortune, but he believes himself John Brown. And John Brown doesn't have a penny. And you come before him and you try to convince him he is John Smith. Can't believe it. You bring his wife, you bring his children, you bring his family, bring all the people to remind him that he is John Smith. But he can't believe it. Hit him over the head, give him shocks. Do all kinds of things to him, but he can't believe he's John Smith. He knows he's John Brown, who doesn't have a nickel. And John Smith has a fortune. You ask him to sign his name John Smith, he will not do it. That's against his ethical code. He is John Brown. You are Jesus Christ. Believe in yourself, Mary Smith. And whatever it is you believe yourself to be. And I can't persuade you that you are Jesus Christ. You're suffering from complete and total amnesia. One day, you will awake. You will awake within the grave of your own skull. And remember who you are. It's only a matter of remembering. May I tell you? You aren't going to earn it. When I return to the being that I really am, I don't earn it. It's grace. Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. And grace is a gift, unmerited, unearned. And so memory returns. So he said, now, follow the pattern of the true words which you have heard from me. Guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Well, who is the Holy Spirit? We are told he is our remembrance. We are told the Holy Spirit, when he comes unto you, he will bring to your remembrance all that you have heard from me. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And what I have told you is true. And he will bring to your remembrance all that I have told you. But who is he? He is your own remembrance that you have forgotten. You have completely forgotten your own identity. He will come. And when he comes, you haven't earned it. It's simply a man awakening from amnesia. And he awakens to what? To what he was before. He lost his memory. We lost our memory deliberately, purposely, to come into this world. And one day, memory will return. And when that memory returns, we are the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no other Lord Jesus Christ. But in the interval, I am asking you to test it. If you really are, and all things are made by him, and all things are his, that I should be able to appropriate anything in this world that I desire. Well, if it is true, how would I test it? But first, believe in your own wonderful human imagination. At the moment when I tell you that that is Jesus, you don't believe it. But I'm telling you, it is. And all things are his. Now, if he really has all things, I can't remember that I am the Lord Jesus Christ, but if I really am, can I, though I still think I am Neville Goddard, 
can I really now put it to the test? Suppose I've never got it, I begin just for a moment to believe I am what Neville Dollar does not believe it is, but I'll try to believe that I am. And then I become it. Well, I become it. And then I try it again. And I become it. Then I try it again. And I try it for friends. And all of a sudden, it does produce itself in action. It produces itself in performance. Well then, although I still don't know, that I really am Jesus Christ, because I haven't had the signs yet. I am proving that the power of which he spoke is true, or I am proving it in performance. Try it. I am telling you, memory will return, and you're going to find out who you are. And when you find out who you are, I am telling you who you are. You are the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no other. Actually, you became what you are, suffering from amnesia for a purpose, for a divine purpose. And one day, you will awaken and you will know exactly who you are. And you are the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible is all about. It's a revelation of an eternal truth written without regard to secular history. So forget the story as history. Here this is 1971. The story told of David is written 1000 BC. Who would believe that a man living today, born in the year 1905, is totally aware as memory returns? And he who was supposed to have been born 1000 BC, that's 3000 years ago, stands before me as a youth, and I am his father, and he knows I am his father. Then where is time? Where is the story, if you take it in a chronological sense, if you take it as secular history, where is it? You rub it out completely. And I am telling you what I know from my own experience. And if men should come into my world, coming in the twinkle of an eye from afar, and all of a sudden they are witnessing an experience that now is the return of my memory. For all of a sudden I wake in a tomb. How long have I been there? And who put me there? I awaken and I know exactly what I must do in order to come out of it. And they are witnessing my birth or return of my memory. For well, that's what it is. For I walk from a profound sleep. That's resurrection. Who would read a story in the fifth chapter of Second Samuel? Where David took the stronghold of Zion and renamed it the city of David. We call it Jerusalem. The house where God loves most of all. Of all the dwelling places of Jacob, he loves Zion. And that's where God dwells. And he took it by going up the water shaft. And he took it in one sudden assault. And he built that area by which he would ascend from the outside in and up at the same time. Therefore he could only build it in a spiral. And he took it in one sudden assault. Who would have thought for one moment that you would experience that in the only way you could ever experience it? That suddenly your body is split in two from top to bottom. And you look at the base of your severed body. At the base is a golden liquid pulsing light. As you contemplate it, you know it is yourself. And you fuse with it. And at the moment of fusion, one sudden assault in a spiral, fiery manner, you ascend into Zion. And there you are, as told in scripture, they take it by violence to come out of it. And they are witnessing my birth or return of my memory. For that's what it is. For I walk with profound sleep. That's resurrection. 
Who will read a story in the fifth chapter, second Samuel, where David took the stronghold of Zion and renamed it the city of David. We call it Jerusalem, the house where God loved most of all. Of all the dwelling places of Jacob, he loved Zion, and that's where God dwells. And he took it by going up the water shaft. And he took it in one sudden assault. And he built that area by which he would ascend from the outside in and up at the same time. Therefore he could only build it in a spiral. And he took it in one sudden assault. Who would have thought for one moment that you would experience that in the only way you could ever experience it. That suddenly your body is split in two from top to bottom. And you look at the base of your severed body. At the base is a golden liquid pulsing light. As you contemplate it, you know it is yourself. And you fuse with it. And at the moment of fusion, one sudden assault in a spiral fiery manner you are sent into Zion. And there you are, as told in Scripture. They take it by violence. The violence takes it by force. And the whole thing reverberates. And does it reverberate? Your skull reverberates so you think the whole thing is coming apart. But it doesn't. You take it by violence. That's how David took it. But then who is he? And that's how the Son of Man ascends into heaven. And everything recorded in Scripture is literally true. The words are fricative, but truth is literal. And you do it in the same manner. Everyone does it in that manner. I'm sharing with you my experiences. I'm telling you, I am not something apart. Believe me. As human as anyone here, all the weaknesses of the flesh, I have had them. I have had many of them still, for that matter. And yet, in spite of all these things, he's spoken of in Scripture, unfolded within me. <clears throat> so I tell you, you are only suffering from amnesia. I can tell you now who you are, but like a person if you've ever seen one, it's a very pleasant sight, may I tell you. To meet someone you know well and love well, and they do not know you. To meet someone who may know you before a certain point in time, and in an interval of time they do not know you at all. That section of time is completely gone. And then they go for maybe ten years, and there is no knowledge whatsoever in that interval of ten years. And all that the doctors can do to bring them back, they can't bring them back to have any knowledge of what happened in those ten years. Our hospitals are filled with them. It's not a pleasant sight to stand before someone that you love dearly, and you always believe they love you, and they do not recognize you. They do not know you. And you can say anything in this world that you want, they cannot relish to anything to do say. Complete amnesia or partial amnesia. You and I are suffering from total amnesia until Christ returns within and awakens because you're only Christ. There is nothing but Christ in the world. There is nothing but God in the world. God became as we are, that we may be as he is. And so, I'm not denying that you are playing a certain part, and believe it implicitly. But believe me, you can, while you can't quite bring back the memory that you are Jesus Christ, you can exercise the power that is Jesus Christ. And I tell you, he is your wonderful human imagination. And you can take your imagination now, see what you would like to see. Believe in the reality of what you are seeing. Persist in that assumption. And it will harden in the fact. Now if all things were made by him, and then you know what you did to make it, try it again. 
and then try it again. And if it works as it will work, then at least you do know that in some strange way, though I cannot bring back the identity of being the Lord Jesus Christ, I can prove a power within me of which I was formerly unaware. And one day, suddenly, it will happen to you. And you will awaken. And when you awaken, you are the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I will be one. Equal. Let no one tell you one because he came before you in the awakening process. He precedes you in rank. No, he can't precede you in rank because there is only one Lord Jesus Christ. So should you tonight awaken? And I awoke almost 12 years ago, this coming July, I will not precede you in rank. No one will precede another in rank. We're all one. And when you know it, you don't want to precede another in rank. For the Lord is one, and his name is one. And the Lord will be king over all the earth, and in that day the Lord will be one, and his name one. And all of us will form one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all. <clears throat> so here, the truth of Scripture is not a conflict between what we call truth and error, or truth and falsehood, so much as it is between the true God and our selfless love for Him and our fickleness. So we are fickle, and we move away from the true God, and worship the false God. For well, tonight, believe me, and see if we cannot in the immediate present, I do not mean next year, I do not even mean next month, and it's only a little days away, but now, try it. He said, who will believe our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, you think that's sheer poetry, beautiful imagery. May I tell you that is true? Just as the prophet Isaiah wrote it. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm is called in Scripture the power of God, and the power of God is called Christ. And may I tell you, it is an actual story he is telling, for it happened to me. Here I am in a room not as big as this, but square like this. And I am seated on the floor talking to my pupils, as it were. Call them disciples, if you will explaining the word of God. And suddenly, one of these listening to me seated on the floor rises quickly and departs the room. And I knew instantly what he was going to do. He is going to tell the authority what I am teaching. I am teaching of a king that is not Caesar. I am teaching of a power unknown to mortal man. I am teaching them that in them is the king that transcends all the seasons of the world, all the powers known to man. And he rises quickly and leaves the room. I knew instantly the authorities would know it and what would happen. And suddenly the door opens and this one dressed in the most glorious robe of the finest raiment entered, tall, handsome man. And here he comes down, and he turns at right angles, turns at right angles, turns at right angles, and comes and faces me. Now we're all standing. The authorities would know it, and what would happen. And suddenly the door opens, and this one, dressed in the most glorious robe, of the finest raiment entered, tall, handsome man. And here he comes down, and he turns at right angles, turns at right angles,
turns at right angles and comes and faces me. Now we're all standing. Then he takes from his attendant a mallet and a wooden peg and he hammers it into my shoulder. Didn't hurt, but he hammers this peg into my shoulder. Then he takes a sharp instrument and with one circular motion he removes my sleeve and my arm is bare from my shoulder to the ends of my fingers. Completely bare, the right arm. And then he extends his arms like a cross, embraces me and kisses me on the neck. I kissed him on the neck. And then the scene is fading and fading and fading. And my sleeve was a baby blue color as he tossed it away. And here is scripture. Would you come out and betray the Son of God with a kiss? Would you reveal him? Because the Son of God is the arm of God. For the Son of God is the power and the wisdom of God. Would you now unveil him and betray his identity? He had to. Everything said in Scripture is true. And when you awake, these things happen. They all happen to you. It was only the arm. But certainly this arm is not as strong as the average strong man's arm in this world. It's just a normal arm. That's only an image. It's only a symbol of the being that awoke within you. You are the arm of God, or the power of God, the wisdom of God. And he will now use you in the play just a freedom. For he nailed upon you the pay, as you're told in Isaiah, and then for a season you will be in control. Only for a season you'll carry the burden, the burden of Israel. And then you'll break the pay and take it off and another will carry it. And another will carry it. But in that interval you will carry it. And you are the power of God and the wisdom of God. And he comes in and he unveils me. Unveils up the body, unveils the arm. For it's the arm that symbolizes the power of God. The creative power of God. And that happened in 1966. Tenth day of October, 1966. So I can't forget them. These dates are indelibly impressed upon me. For everything said of him, I have an awakened within myself, must experience. And everything said of him, you must experience as he awakens within you. So do not let anyone tell you of any Jesus Christ outside of you. You are not going to find him. He speaks within you. And he dreams the life that you are now experiencing. He is dreaming that life. And one day he will awaken. And then memory will return. And you will not be John Brown. You will be and you will know it. For Jesus Christ. And you go to bed at night. And you'll put down John Brown as the world sees John Brown on the bed. But you fall asleep as Jesus Christ. And your nights are not the nights that they were prior to that moment. You're instructing and you're teaching. And you aren't frightened of a thinking frightening in any dream. No more nightmares. Just teaching that anything happened, you know exactly who you are. And you simply are rested. If it don't hurt, you're rested. Just let things move. For memory has returned. And the being who was all in the beginning has now returned. In the morning you'll pick up the little garment called John Brown and you'll go through life as John Brown, not trying to disturb anyone in the world. So when it's called John, you answer. Mr. Brown, you answer. But you know exactly who you are. And you're playing a dual part until the end when you take off for the last time John Brown.